Hey. hey guys, uh, thanks for having me. It's actually a real pleasure. Usually I get to deal with uh, uh, stream ecology and uh, food webs and I do a lot of work with aquatic insects and flow regimes and whatnot, but today I'm going to talk about a recent project I took on with uh, my colleague Dr. Peter Moyle here at UC Davis uh, where we looked at two-way trap and haul as a potential conservation strategy for anadromous fish in California and really throughout the Pacific Northwest. So just to lay a little, uh, a little um, groundwork here, uh, Central Valley Salmonids are in a, a very, very difficult place. Central Valley Steelhead and Spring Run Chinook are, are state and federally threatened species. Uh, Winter Run Chinook are federally endangered species. They occur only in one location in the entire world. That's the Sacramento River below Keswick Dam. Uh, historically, uh, they occurred in, in this place. If anyone takes a guess uh, what this is, is a photo from the 1800s by Livingston Stone. Livingston Stone. This is the lower McLeod River that is now completely inundated by Shasta Reservoir, so it's covered. Um, low gradient, productive reach, uh, cold water spring, winter run Chinook were the uh, long run fish, so making migrations uh, during the winter as adults and spawning between April as late as August. Um, really peak spawning occurring during June and there's only uh, one place you can do that is a cold water sensitive species and that's in volcanic springs or close to volcanic springs to really have that cold water that 12 to 13 degree uh, cold water is necessary for egg incubation. Uh, today, winter run habitat looks like this. This is the reach below Keswick Dam. Uh, again, it's the only location where winter runs successfully spawn. Um, there are very few individuals left. 2014-15, uh, the dole escapement was about 3,500. 2015-16, uh, it was about 1,500. My understanding are the numbers this year are, are uh, potentially even lower than that. So it's a very uh, difficult situation for winter run, um, and it's uh, caused uh, the, the regulatory agencies, primarily the National Marine Fisheries Service, to consider kind of extreme options, uh, potentially extreme options, um, with respect to recovery for these fish. Uh, that's what really started our investigation uh, into two-way trap and haul, which was published in Fisheries uh, just this month. Um, again, with, with Dr. Peter Moyle, um, we conducted a series of interviews. We looked at a series of case studies in the Pacific Northwest where trap and haul was being uh, conducted, and we were actually able to look at some data as well. Um, and just quickly to decipher, there's, there's trap and haul, which is the movement of um, one part of the life cycle. So you can move adult fish above a dam and the juveniles can move downstream volitionally uh, or you could move juveniles as they do in the Columbia downstream via barge that would be one way trap and haul two-way trap and haul is two parts of the life cycle so trapping adult salmon below a dam transporting them by truck above a dam into historical headwater habitat letting them spawn catching their uh, their juvenile um, progeny as they out migrate moving them via truck uh, downstream below the dam where they can then move out to the ocean um, freely and so we really want to look at what programs are currently out there in the Pacific Northwest, how effective are these programs at meeting their uh, success criteria, and, and really what does the science say about these programs? We looked at, um, we found, we kind of looked at four um, important themes here. The first one being transportation effects on fish and delayed mortality. Bonded all found in the Columbia River system that juveniles that were transported downstream via truck or barge uh, were likely to experience 10 to 19 times greater uh, rates of string in the non-natal habitats. Muir and Rachisky in 2006 and 12, also in the Columbia, found that juvenile fish that were transported via barge downstream in the Columbia generally made it to the ocean at earlier uh, time periods and also were of um, a, a smaller size, so reduced growth rates, which has implications for uh, swimming and predation and whatnot as well. Halverson in 2009 found that uh, barge transportation of fish could lead, or did lead, I should say, to impaired auditory function. Um, and in those fish when they were released into the Columbia River. 
Kiefer et al. found that juveniles that were transported downstream via barge, uh, when they returned as adults, they were four times more likely to actually fail uh, volitional passage over dams, so via ladders, right? They couldn't actually, uh, they would make it and then they couldn't make it and they would experience fallback. There's a high case of mortality associated with dam fallback as well. <clears throat> and then Kiefer et al. also found that um, adults that were transported upstream uh, experienced 48% higher pre-spawn mortality than fish that were naturally able to swim to swim upstream. We also looked at uh, population replacement. So that is uh, very simply, it's also referred to cohort replacement rate. The key number there being one. So for every fish that you take from below a dam and you put into historical habitat, how many future spawners does that lead to, right? And you can do this via um, genetic pedigree analysis. And this has been conducted in the Willamette River system on the Sandy M rivers, the south and the north fork. Uh, Evans et al. found that the cohort replacement range ranged between 0.96 to 1.56, so pretty good. So for every spawner you're moving above a dam, you were generally getting one or more back. Um, started all on Cougar Dam, uh, Cougar Reservoir on the South Fork Mackenzie, found that that number was, was a bit lower, so some variability there. And O'Malley et al. in another study found the cohort replacement rate right around 1.0. So some uncertainty um, uh, with, with population replacement. And if you continue, obviously, to take adults from a, a population below a dam and you're not getting that return, that can, that can turn into a, into a sink, which could be a problem. Importantly, I think in these Willamette programs, they're having uh, real trouble with actually capturing juvenile out migrants. It was very difficult to do is to catch the juveniles. And so they're actually, in these studies, these fish were passing volitionally through spillways and turbines uh, through the dam and, and getting these replacement values. So we wanted to look into the out-migrant capture efficiency a bit. We focused in on the Deschutes River program. This has been around the two-way trap and haul program, which has been around since about 2009. We looked at data from FERC studies over a four-year period. And in this case, so, so generally what happens is they trap adult salmon below Pelton Dam. They bring it above uh, Round Butte Dam or Lake Billy Chinook where they're released, they can spawn and, they're, and they're, um, their progeny will migrate through the reservoir. In this case, they were actually trying, they were having difficulty with that, so they were actually trying to supplement and put a bunch of hatchery fry in the tributaries um, above the dams. Um, and in that four year period, um, they released 5.0 million hatchery fry and small trees of spring run chinook and steelhead. Of those, 169,000 uh, individuals actually made it through the reservoir, so from the tributaries through the reservoir to the trap that were captured and released. That's a capture rate of 0.3 to 7.9 percent. Um, and all told, uh, that resulted in about 102 spring run chinook and 340 or so steelhead returned as adults below uh, Pelton. There was no gen genetic pedigree done on these fish, so it's very uh, likely that some of these fish were also strays. So we found, I think, several uncertainties uh, that you guys can read about in the paper. Um, delayed mortality being one, population replacement being another, um, out-migrant capture efficiency. And we also looked at the role of hatchery supplementation, which I'm gonna touch on in just a second. The other thing we found is all these programs um, are relatively new. They're either in experimental phases or have just started. So really 2009, 2008, 2009 to the present, um, except for uh, the Baker River program, which is if, if you ever uh, get to a meeting with a National Marine Fishery Service on this, you hear a lot about this program for good reason. It's been somewhat successful. The two-way trap and haul program for the Baker River program is focused on sockeye. What you see there is a floating surface collector, it's a, a juvenile out-migration trap, which I'll talk about here in a second as well. Um, and if you look at the adult sockeye returns, um, I should say they started uh, trapping adults as a one-way trap and haul in 1925. Uh, juveniles were able to move volitionally downstream. It did not, the program did not do particularly well. Those were upgraded in the 1950s and then again in the 60s to what they call gulpers, which are large boats that kind of float around the uh, reservoir and pump out an attraction flow to attract juveniles that are moving out of tributaries into the reservoir. Um, that that happened through about 2008, uh, not terribly successful. 
between 1980 and uh, 2008 or so, they averaged about 5,000 adult returns in sockeye. Um, but then we see a big jump in those numbers starting about 2008 uh, to the present where we saw about 30,000 adults returning annually, 50,000 in 2015. I think the numbers are actually even higher this year. And it's often pointed to as the technology is now there. These floating surface collectors have come online. You can see them on the Lewis River, the Clackamas River, in the Pacific Northwest, other locations. The technology is there to, to attract these juveniles and actually capture them. And this is what's pointed to and what they're considering, at least partially in California, and using uh, to, to improve capture efficiency um, in juveniles. And if you look at the adult returns there again, so on the x-axis time and total adult returns there on the y-axis. Um, you see those floating surface collectors really put in place in 2008, 2009, and then 2012 in the lower reservoir, and those adult numbers really jump up. And so we started to interview folks and talk about this and, and think, uh, kind of dig into this a little bit more. And, and we noticed right at the time that the floating surface collectors, we also realized that uh, there were significant hatchery modifications made. Um, so they were, uh, the Baker River program specifically was beginning to augment uh, their populations. So on this y-axis, we have to total hatchery fry uh, supplemented into the system, uh, adult sockeye return and these are offset by three years account for the life history of, of sockeye um, but there's a very tight correlation between the number of fry the number of hatchery fry you actually put into a reservoir into the tributaries and how many adults you get back this would be another way to look at it. And so we found this pretty tight correlation between if you put more fish in the reservoir, more fish in the bucket, you tend to get more fish back, more adults back. And so I think we really, uh, one of the conclusions we found from this was these programs are rarely self-sustaining from a wild fish perspective. It's very unlikely, at least right now, to take uh, two adult wild fish and get two adult wild fish back four years later or five years later if you're dealing with Chinook. So really, again, the things we point out in this paper are, are focusing on uncertainties, uh, but we also realize that animals like winter run Chinook are in a very, uh, very precarious position right now. Um, I would love to hear if anyone has any ideas on winter run Chinook. There are very few options for this species. And so we think that uh, approaching these types of projects experimentally um, and adaptively managing them and not distracting kind of from more comp comprehensive uh, conservation strategies is probably the way to move forward with winter run Chinook um, and uh, probably less so with something like spring run Chinook which does have three populations. They're considering this for spring run Chinook on the Yuba River, trapping them below Engelbright, moving them above New Bullage Bar, and then uh, winter run Chinook and they're also considering it with Central Valley Steelhead um, as well. That's what I got for you guys. Any questions, I'll take. We have time for a couple of questions. Thank you for your talk. Um, I can imagine that most of the juveniles, well, many of the juveniles don't get in the collection trap so that you'll be kind of creating another life history strategy for the winter run, which is living in the lake and spawning in the tributaries. So have they seen that happening in the um, Baker River program with the sockeye? Yeah, so good question. So sockeye have a bit of a different life history, right? So they're actually uh, rearing for a year in the reservoir. Um, we know that in Shasta Reservoir and other places there are, from s historical stocking practices, there are ad fluvial Chinook populations already in many of these systems. Um, for winter runs specifically, uh, the traps are considering is actually trapping fish at the mouth of the McLeod River, so or just downstream of the mouth. So really trying to intercept them before they make it through the reservoir. But they're also testing, they're also watching fish how they migrate. They've actually been pretty successful migrating to head of reservoir for winter run Chinook. Um, so depending on what trap they use, you would expect certainly expect um, something to occur there uh, that could potentially change your life history. I would agree with that. Yeah.